Revelation this morning. And the reason I say that is that we would have seen eternity through the eyes of a disciple. So um, let's just read some verses from Colossians, um, just to give us a foundation about, on what we want to talk about. So we're going to be looking at verse 15 of chapter 1, and then we're going to look at a couple of verses in chapter 2. Okay, everyone got that? Colossians chapter 1, and verse 15. Okay, everyone got it? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. I'm going to read through to verse um, 22. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in his gospel. And then over to chapter 2 and verses 13 to 15, some of my favourite verses here. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, by the cross. Isn't that powerful stuff? And you know, you've got the whole of the Old Testament and New Testament, and just in those verses alone. Now, I did say to you at the beginning, as we begin this study, it would have been helpful to have read from John's perspective as a disciple on the island of Patmos, writing the, the letter to the Re of Revelation. And the reason for that is that John learned, as we must learn, to be three dimensional in our faith. So adopting a worldview, and we've talked about it before, that rejects the two-dimensional two linear way of thinking, the Greek way of thinking, A goes to B goes to C equals D, and thinking, remember the rock in the pool I spoke about when I first came here? Imagine a pool, a big, big lake, and you can see the mountains reflect and everything, and suddenly this great big rock comes into the middle of it, and big splash, and then there's all these ripples. Now this is big picture thinking, which we are meant to be, thinking like, as we try to grasp what God's word is saying. We don't just think in a A goes to B goes to C equals D fashion. We're thinking about our actions that have consequences, our prayers that have consequences, our contacts that have consequences. And as we do this, we begin to grasp that our existence has meaning in the whole scheme of things. And as God's children, we have an important role to play in outworking his plans, not just for us, but for the benefit of the whole of humanity. Now by saying that, I realise that has the potential to both excite us and it has the potential to terrify us all at the same time because that means that we can't hide in our own protected environments anymore. But rather, we become responsible as members of, of a body of believers locally, nationally and universally for the propagation of the salvation of God provided in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a huge privilege, but it's a huge responsibility, and it's not something we do particularly well. 
Now, if we've been on a journey through from Revelation, and maybe we'll go there one day, it's a really great book to read, we would see the key to understanding the book is actually not in trying to decipher all the pictures and images and words or build some kind of two-dimensional timetable. Do you, I don't know if any of you remember that book. You'll remember it, Ruth. They used to have a book. And brethren, if you're a premillennial dispensationist, you would like this. And basically, they had a big book, and they, they separated the Bible up into millennia, and then basically, they opened the book up. It's a big, great big book. They open it up, and all these drawings and tells you how the word's gonna work, world is going to work and how it's going to end. Amazing, really, when you think about it. But, you know, it's a kind of dangerous thinking, really, isn't it? Because once we start putting things into a system and living to that system, God changes his mind. And then what do we do? So today, briefly, over, and over the next few weeks, as we move towards Easter, as we journey there, we'll be looking at the cross as a place that Jesus died for us, but also at the bigger picture and the implications and the application of that too. And it's going to be full of questions. So here we go. First question. Do we really believe in God? Everyone's going, okay. Or are we so caught up with our ideas of God or the scriptures so that the person of God in reality is kind of left out of the equation? Certainly as I've read commentaries and some very thoughtful books, I get this impression as I read that the Christian church is looking for something, is interested in devising a plan to bring folk in, but never really wants to look at the person of God. Because deep down there seems to be a doubt that he really exists. No one will admit to that, and I'm not looking for an answer, okay? But it reminded me of a story of this atheist who was walking through a wood, and he was admiring all the accidents of evolution. And so he was saying, look, what are these majestic trees? Look at this wonderful river. And as he was going through, admiring the flora and the fauna, he heard a rustle in the trees. And he turned around, and there was a seven-foot grizzly bear. So he screamed, and he ran. And as he ran, he heard this thing, ba-dunk, 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 behind him. And as he looked over his shoulder, he saw it getting nearer and nearer, and he was getting so scared, tears were running down his face, and it was getting nearer and nearer, and then he tripped over a, over a stump, and he flew down, on, down on the path, and he went to get up, and the grizzly bear was just over him, ready to get him, and he says, oh God, help me! Suddenly everything froze, time stopped. The bear froze in place. The forest was silent, even the river stopped flowing. And a light came from the sky, and it said, you deny my existence for all these years. You teach others that I don't exist. And you even credit to a creation to a cosmic accident. Do you believe in me? Do you, do you want me to help you out, really, at this predicament? Am I then to count you as a believer? Well, the atheist looked right at the light, and he said, look, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I could never say that I could become a Christian after all these years. That wouldn't do my credibility any good. He said, but you could do something for me. Would you make the bear a Christian? <laughs> so the voice said, very well. And the light went off. The river ran. The sound of the forest resumed. The bear suddenly dropped to his knees, put his paws together and said, for what am I about to receive? May the Lord make me do anything for <laughs> You see, we are what matter. What we, who we are really matters to us. Next slide, John, please. Uh, who we are matters. Spirituality rooted in our humanity. You see, that God should become human in Jesus Christ. It actually complicates so many ideas that, about the humanity of God. Jesus, during his time on earth, was so ordinary. And it has always been hard to fathom such an incredible manifestation of deity. You see... Jesus was so human that he didn't fit the perception of other folk. Even those announcing his coming had trouble recognising who he was as the Messiah. But didn't John the Baptist send a delegation and says, are you the one or is there someone else we should be looking for? And this was because Jesus was so distant from what, God, that what John and the nation were expecting the Messiah to be. And we're just exactly the same today when we consider Jesus. 
when we consider God becoming man, we have this expectation of what he was like. But it was their perception of God which created the distance. And so we have to be so very careful about our own minds at times. This was the barrier in their thinking. You see, the question we need to ask is, why does it seem so easy for us to believe in a God is so holy that he's unapproachable? Now think for a minute about what you'd have to do if you had to approach God by yourself. And that was the eternal struggle of the Jews of the Old Testament. They were asking that question all the time. They wanted, it was a desire of their heart to be close to God. They wanted to, to know him. They knew the Messiah would bring that about, but they wanted to know how they could do it. They just wanted to act all the time. And it was Micah who said, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? With calves a year old, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? It's getting serious. He's saying, what is there that I've got that is so precious that I can get to God so I can engage with him on a personal level? See, our pursuit of God as a human race has led folk to incredible extremes in an attempt to appropriate this blessing. You know, in Jeremiah, he said, they built places to Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom to sacrifice their sons and daughters to Molech. Though I never commanded, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such a detestable thing and so make Judah sin. Some of the tribes around Israel, they were actually human sacrifice, burning their children to a god called Molech, a god from Tyre. And actually, if you want to understand where he comes in, Actually, the cult of, of Molech was actually brought in at the time of Jezebel. Do you remember Ahab and Jezebel and when Elisha ran from him? Well, Jezebel brought in the god of Molech, okay, and human sacrifice into Israel. Is it any wonder that Elisha was frightened of her? And evidently, the sacrifice of children was so, such a dreadful reality amongst the neighbors of Israel that they were afraid that it was going to infect Israel itself. But if you were a bystander and you, and you let it happen, you were also guilty for being complicit in that. And such were the lengths folk would go to so they could reach the divine. You see, when we lose sight of our great God, we resort to worship that which we can qualify with our own eyes. And so we become more concerned with what it looks like rather than what it should be. And throughout church history, individuals have done some really strange things in order to gain God's approval. For example, there was a man called Simeon the Stylite. Have you ever heard of him? And he went out into the desert and he had this pole put up and he had a platform on the top and he lived on it for years because he wanted to separate himself from anything secular, anything that would infect him so that he can have a communion with God. And then others have opted for a similar sort of monastic lifestyle in the pursuit of God. And in every instance, they've chosen this life of deprivation so they can have an experience of God with all the tr without all the trappings of the secular world. It sounds really quite appealing in some ways, doesn't it? And I would have thought today, with the business of life, etc., how people today should be opting for that kind of seclusion. And it's on the decline. But I wonder if it's because folks have become so secular themselves that there is no desire to know God at the roots of our humanity anymore. Too often, you see, God seems so far removed from our life. Some have given up the only idea of even knowing him. And they see him as some kind of director in the sky who's got no fun, who doesn't want to give you freedom and has no re takes away your choice. And the sad thing is that too many folk are just fed up with looking for God. They take one look at the church and at Christians and they come to an obvious conclusion, well, if that, there's got to be more to knowing God than that. And in their frustration, they just opt simply for knowing God and referring to him in some kind of vague, nebulous way. You know, I remember meeting a, an elderly lady in the park and we got chatting and it wasn't long we got on to eternal things. And, and um, she said to me, when I was a young woman, 
my husband and I looked at all the various religions around and decided that we didn't want anything to do with any of them. So we determined that we wouldn't believe in God and we would teach our children and our children's children and their children not to believe in God, but they lived morally upright lives and ethical lives. And they were a good bunch of people. Here she was bragging about it. And a great, up to her great-grandchildren were all the same. They didn't want to know God anymore. They were doing it themselves. So the Christian church, in some cases it seems, is locking the world out of its existence and holding on to everything that is irrelevant, comfortable in the fact that they're doing their bit. But this is not worship. Nor is it any form that excludes us from who we really are and what, through God's eyes, we are meant to be. So let me try a little exercise with you this morning. If you've got a piece of paper, you might want to write it down, or let me encourage you to do it in your own quiet time this week. If I said the word holy, write down five words, just the words that come into your mind. Now, I'm not going to ask you, but I'll just give you the five words I come up with. So the first one is set apart. We were talking about that earlier, weren't we, when we were talking about dedication, about being set apart by God. Each one of us has our unique gifts, and we all make up the body of believers, and so we all have a specific function. When we are set apart as priests to be the servants of God, to build the church and to function as a body. If everyone knows what their function is, no one else is going to want to do your job, are they? Second word I came up with was special. How great is the love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. There's real hope in that. God has chosen us as his children. He's given us a future. Third word. Needed. This means that you're not alone. None of us want to be lonely. Some of us, I like my own company. But some of us can't cope with our own company. Maybe someone's died and we're on our own now and we feel that, actually, I just need that company. And you miss those little things that go along with a relationship. But God is saying that you're not alone. I know those things aren't physically there, but I'm here. I will provide, and often has provided the church, so people can, don't need to be alone anymore. Next word, relationship. We're in relationship with God, of course, but we've also got a relationship with others in our community, especially in the church. And so we, we have a unique relationship with each other, whether you like it or not. So this is, I had an accident years ago, lost my memory, so... My, I, got, I got a hard drive wiped and, and rebooted at age 21. So I lost all my childhood, okay, and I remember incidents, but I don't remember relationships to so my parents. I never really knew them as mum and dad. There was no sort of paternal link. And it sounds sad, but it's not, because I don't know. Okay, so, but, and of course I, I loved them dearly, got to know them really well over the next 30, 40 years, but... My understanding of church, okay, is not unique really, but I take it seriously. So if I was stuck in Peterborough, let's say, on, I got off the train and I was stuck, and there was no more transport, and the only phone, phone number I had in my, my book was Terry's, and it was two o'clock in the morning, I'd think it was perfectly reasonable if we ring him up and get him out of bed and say, Terry, can you come and get me? Without moaning. <laughs> okay, but equally I'd expect him to do the same to me if he was stuck in Inverness and needed a lift <laughs> and I would, do, I would move heaven and earth to get to him and that is the unique relationship that we are meant to have as believers we belong to each other because we are in Christ together there is more, it's not just like a blood relation there is more and, third, and last of all, the last word is priesthood and I think this is such an important word the problem is, when you say priest, everyone thinks of someone dressed in robes, little collar, or whatever. Okay, that is not what it might identify their office, but actually the function, does anyone know the function of a priest? Primary function of a priest. Anyone know? The primary function of the priest is to encourage access to worship. 
So the priestly order in the temple were there to represent the people before God, okay? With the new covenant, we are now all called priests. That means we've all got access to God. So our function as believers is to introduce others into relationship with God. So it doesn't matter what the scenario, and we mentioned that earlier about approaching people, anyone comes to you, maybe you've got to be a listening ear, maybe you've got the one who puts your arm around their shoulder, maybe you're the one who's got to put your hand in the pocket. But actually what you do is you enable others' lives so that they can come to a point of worship. This is what it's for. So as we live for Christ, we're bringing people to worship. Turn with me, if you would, to, to Revelation chapter 5, just quickly. I can't resist it, really. Revelation chapter 5. Let me read some verses to you. This is the view of eternity. And it's so much bigger and better than we can ever imagine. In Revelation 5 and verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousands, the old word was myriad. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on them singing and all that is in them singing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb to, the, to be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. This is a look into eternity. What is it? Timothy Dwight says, the Bible is the window in our prison world through which we look into eternity. We can't manufacture anything. God has done it all, and it's all achieved by the cross. Do you see that? Who we are matters. We cannot achieve our own holiness or any real level of sanctity in our own strength. Nor can we impose it on others. We need to drop our pretense, and we just have to meet people where they are. I read a lovely story of a family who was out to dinner and there was a six-year-old boy amongst the family. And as they were taking the orders, they were all get, doing the roast and everything else and the, the waitress come to the boy and says, I'd like burger and chips, please, loads of ketchup. And his mother said, no, he won't. He'll have roast beef with all the trimmings, especially vegetables. But the waitress ignored her and took the boy's order and said, extra ketchup. And off she went. And the little boy said, you know, I really like her. She knows that I'm real. Do you see the point? Too often we've been blinkered by all the baggage and all the nonsense of the past generations that they've loaded onto us. And instead of taking the good and throwing out the rubbish, we've just become hoarders. And now we've got no room for others. And even worse, we call it heritage and we've got no room for God either. We come as we are. And our God in his grace and his mercy brings us near and actuates by his spirit a change that makes each of us set apart, special, needed, in a new relationship that participates in the divine nature. And he makes us priests so that we can be ministers of light as well. And all of this so that we might understand him better, that we might know his mind and his heart for the world. That is amazing. And we work so hard to achieve it, and yet he's laid it on the plate. Who we are matters, you see. Our spirituality must be rooted in our humanity. But secondly, God defines himself. You know, the most defining moment of God's existence was when he came in human form in pursuit of a relationship with every single one of us. And here comes another question. What's more difficult to believe? That Jesus is God... Or that God became a man. That's interesting, isn't it? You know, Christians, over the years, and certainly through my theological training, we went to great lengths to prove that Jesus is God. Actually, we had to do, I remember, an exam, and we were filmed. It was a, an oral exam, and we had to study for I don't know how long. And then we had to argue to the camera for the Trinity and the God as man. That was an amazing effort we had to put into that. 
But you know, the Bible writers place more emphasis on God becoming a man. The Apostle John gives us one of the most touching descriptions of Jesus' birth. Beyond the description of Jesus as the Word of God, now God has become flesh and dwells among us. Or as someone else put it, God has moved into our neighbourhood. I think that's just <laughs> lovely. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Was it Paul said to Timothy, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given at its proper time. You know, as God defines himself in human form, taking on humanity, associating with those that have lost their way, understanding the reality of poverty, dealing with all the con artists, experience the, great, the grief of lost relations and friends, but then enjoying the laughter of good company, enjoying the celebration of a birthday and a wedding. I don't think for a moment that Jesus was a shy, retiring type who sat in the corner with a straight face. That would just be, wouldn't it, a contradiction in terms. How could he ever give us a life that is full if that wasn't his experience? How can he answer our problems with temptation if that wasn't his experience? How could he understand our frustration with different people if that wasn't his experience? This is God as man, fully God, fully man. The humanity of Jesus was not meant to be a disguise. It was there for the purpose of revealing God's true nature. God came to reveal himself in human form. What did Jesus say to Philip? If you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. That actually puts a face on God that makes us want to run to him. How can we ever miss the point when it's as plain as the nose on our face? How can we misread all those facts? But you know, so many make a similar mistake when they think about Jesus, about his birth in a filthy stable where you wouldn't let your dog stay for the night, let alone have a baby. Think of the health implications. And in today's society, we'd be, we would be appalled. If this had happened in our village, what would we say? Well, the baby would be taken away by social services. There would be a media circus, wouldn't there, over the fact that this had ever been allowed to happen, or would it? Immediately, at his birth, he is identifying with humanity, and he's only just been born. Not just in the society of Palestine, but in Swavesey, in Cambridge, in London, Birmingham, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Cardiff, Glasgow, Inverness. There are still too many in our world that have nowhere to lay their own head. And that's through no fault of their own. I mean, do you realise that in Brazil, children as young as two are abandoned and left to fend them them for themselves? And they live in sewers. In fact, in that instance, in the past, many of those children have been rounded up by death squads and then they've been exterminated as vermin. But what do we see on our news outlets? Do we see anything about that? I'll tell you what we see on the news. Celebrity and celebrity opinion. People dress strangely or a sporting event. In his life, in which you've only got a small record of, we are aware that Jesus came from a working class background, that he generated a living from the family's carpentry business, and he understood that if you don't work, you don't eat. And in the last three years, when he started to preach and teach and perform miracles, he never tried, uh, tried to rip folk off. Rather, he talked about the power of God to heal and transform lives. From the point of his arrest to his execution and death on the cross, there is no record that he ever complained or cursed or even protested his innocence. The only recorded words of Jesus in these last moments of the, his time on earth were of provision, of forgiveness, and of life. You see, too often the, mid, the images that come to mind when we think of Jesus are the snowy nativity scene, or we think about Easter, we think of eggs and lilies, and all those, stuff, all those things. And the Bible gives us a much different perspective of what was really going on when Jesus came into this world. 
See, who we are matters. Our spirituality has got to be rooted in our humanity. God has defined himself, but finally we come to the cross. And the cross is a place of choices. Next slide, please. God made the choice to make us the sacrifice for our salvation. And in doing so, he gives us the option to choose between a life that will not be without its struggles, but will be vibrant, but will be real, will be full of purpose, promising a bright future in heaven. Or we can choose life in our own style. We can live by our own rules. And that's absolutely fine. But I have to tell you, the eternal consequences of that are pretty grim. Because you'll be answerable for your own mistakes and your own sin, and you'll be liable to judgment and damnation in hell. Now, I don't say that with any pleasure. I don't want to frighten anyone, but I have to tell you, time is far too short to be playing games with this. You and I could be snuffed out like that. But, you know, the Bible covers all eventualities so that there can be no reason to accuse God of not doing his job thoroughly. And also, so that ignorance is no excuse. So consider this. In Luke chapter 23, we can see what the Roman system did to maintain its own ideals. And the way in which they dealt with many forms of opposition, and it was far from democratic. Many people, of course, were dissatisfied with the system, and they didn't like the treatment they were getting. And so they felt that the only way to respond to that was fight fire with fire. And so they engaged in all kinds of terrorism and rebelling and stirring up slave armies. You know, we've heard about Spartacus, amazing story actually. But you know, all these things, and they encouraged them. Other people in society decided that they would take advantage of the situation, looked out for themselves. People like the tax collectors, for example, who had a bit of money and bought the round, as it were, and actually could probably speak two or three different languages, but then charge more tax so they actually put money in their own pocket. The ultimate deterrent that the Romans used was crucifixion. And crucifixion is probably the cruelest form of execution. It's based upon impalement that was used by the Assyrians. Now, the Assyrians, what they would do, they would cut off the victim's hands and feet, and then they would put a stake through them and impale them. Pretty awful. The forms of, cruci of crucifixion in Roman times varied from one place to another. So the cross could be upright or it could be an X. Sometimes they, they it, was al it always included a flogging and then sometimes they either tied or nailed the arms and legs to the cross. Then they would strip the victim naked so they would be ashamed and everyone would take the neck, okay? And then... Up to about 72 hours later, some people weren't dead. And so what they would do is they would break their legs so they would hang on the cross and so they couldn't push themselves out so they couldn't breathe and so then they would suffocate to death. And there's no real need to go into any more detail than that. The Bible just says they crucified it. It was a, a common form of punishment. Nothing more had to be said. The fact that someone was crucified was shameful and it was appalling but it was also personal to the spectator and it made it a brilliant deterrent. Now in the face of death, most awful, the eternal son of God, the bright morning star, reaches out to a lost humanity. In death, he's not without his critics. Two men, one either side of him. One of them gave him a hard time. And I think that just typifies a humanity who, right to the bitter end, maintains its own agenda, preferring to take a chance on eternity rather than to have faith. The other guy, well, he was in dire circumstances too. He came with nothing to Jesus. He came with the eye of faith that, that saw through the misery on the cross and looked into the face of God. It wasn't a hallucination. There was blood and sweat and there was shame. But it was all replaced by love when Jesus said to him, today, you'll be with me in paradise. Well, the cross is a place of choices. The challenge to us today is just choose. Shall we pray? We thank you, Lord, that you give us clear choices in our lives.